boom, boom. What happened to my PowerPoint? Mark has troubles. All right. Okay. Hold the lights. Okay, so when we last sort of lecture that we had, uh, we were talking about mannerism. Right, which was this sort of breakdown of the ideals of the Italian Renaissance, where uh, what we saw with people like Raphael, Michelangelo, Leonardo, was you know stability, symmetry, sort of a perfect harmony in you know, sort of all parts. And Leonardo's a little weird with that, right? Titian and Giorgione, because they're Venice, they're a little strange as well. Uh, but what we started to see when we looked at mannerist art from, and remember, mannerism is sort of after the 1520s when the perfect harmony of European society is also breaking down because of the Reformation, right? The church has been questioned. And we start to see that art after the 1520s becomes just kind of strange. Space gets collapsed. Figures become artificial, right? Uh, modeled after often other masters, but they become sort of less natural looking. So you get strange proportions, right? You get crowded. Uh, like they're chalking as much stuff in as they possibly can. You get odd and also decorative colors, right? And so when we look at Tintoretto, who was a pupil of Titian in Venice, all of these things are there, right? It's the conversion of Saul. This is when Saul of Tarsus, who was persecuting Christians, is struck blind from heaven, right? And he converts, becomes St. Paul, who writes half of the New Testament. And so he's been knocked off his horse. There he is in the foreground. There's his horse running into the water. But you can see that it's almost like that whole scene is lost with all of this hubbub around it, right? Uh, horses charging in every direction. Colors that are sort of bright and lurid, this, this sort of magenta. Uh, soldier's uniform here that's picked up in the, uh, the decoration on the horse, this bright yellow of the figure charging off who, you know, can't hold his horse, and even the anatomy, okay, he's got one leg on each side, but there's just something weird that happens over there. It's almost like he decided not to draw the other half of the figure, you know? Um, and the more we see the, the, what's going on in the right corner, where the guy seems to be pushing horses up the bridge, you know? It's just it's just this cacophony of, of figures everywhere. That's the whole of mannerism, right? It's confusing. Yeah? Now, if we look 50 years later at Caravaggio, in the early, that should say 1600 01. Sorry about the typo. Right, not 1660, 1660 um, Caravaggio, working 50 years later, simplifies the scene. Right? So there's no, there's no, no secondary, extraneous figures out there that get in the way of understanding it. Saul has been knocked off his horse. Right? He's been struck blind, and you can see that Caravaggio wants to read this, wants us to read this really clearly, right? He's flailing with his arms, right? He can't see, so he's simply reaching out. Now that is almost like a different view on the same figure that Tintoretto gives us, but he's right down in the front, you know, right in close up, reaching up, and, and the the idea of being knocked blind is for Caravaggio a, an issue of light. What is it? Like this spotlight shining on him from up above, and the background is entirely dark, and that helps him to, to simplify the scene as well. And his horse is a little perplexed, and, and the groom behind him has to hold the horse, right, to keep him from stomping on Saul, with one hoof up. But the darkness of the background sort of focuses us, so all we look at is, is, is Saul slash Paul in the foreground. His helmet's fallen off, his sword off to the side, the horse he's fallen off of, and the old man that's holding the horse back to keep him from running away. Whereas with Tintoretto, it's again, it's just, it's just, there's all this fluff, all this fuzz going on around, right? 
So Caravaggio seems to be reacting against mannerism on a certain level, simplifying it. And this is really a sort of an interesting moment. Uh, historically, what art historians call this new movement with artists like Caravaggio is the Baroque, the Baroque period. Now, you may have heard that term before because it's used for music history as well, right? Usually music that's from the Baroque period comes somewhat later. And the term is often used outside of art history to refer to a very ornate and dramatic style. Now, Caravaggio isn't particularly ornate, but he is particularly dramatic. Right? And putting Saul slash Paul right in the foreground is part of that drama. Right? And this is huge, seven feet tall or so, right? Larger than life size. And it's almost like he comes right out into your space. Right? It's just very, very dramatic. And the drama is picked up by this sort of it's kind of stagey in a way, you know? It's lit like a theater piece, right? With this idea of almost artificial light for the light of God that is, that is not the saw off his horse. And what we're going to see as we look at Baroque art is that there is this interest in drama in Baroque art, heightening the sense of drama. And this is one of the few moments in art history where we can talk about a, a sort of a cause and effect. Right? Um, and the cause and effect comes out of a, sort of a broader historical context. Okay, so this is not going to be sort of the 16th century in five minutes. Right? 1517, right? Martin Luther questions the church. Wittenberg door, he gets his 95 beefs with the church, he nails them to the Wittenberg door, right? These are the problems I've got with the Catholic Church. He's a monk, right? He, char he, he, he challenges the local uh, archbishop to a debate. The archbishop doesn't, won't bother, right? The, doesn't want to give him the time of day. And this uh, Luther's attempt to reform the church his protests lead to the Protestant Reformation. Right? And the Catholic Church decides, at least early on, you know, 1517, they decide, let's not even honor it with a response. Right? We've seen this sort of thing before. Uh, it'll, it'll run itself out. 25 years later, it's not running itself out. Right? It's actually getting stronger, so that almost all of the German territories have converted to Protestantism. Right? Parts of France have converted to Protestantism. The Low Countries, half of the Low Countries have converted to Protestantism. Right? It's a growing problem for the church, is this division. England right, goes Protestant, not because they care about religion, but because Henry VIII wants a divorce. Right? So, uh, half of Europe is moving away from the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church decides, 1543, we need to reform. We need to do something to answer Luther's protests. Luther's dead by that time, right? But still, uh, to answer his protests, to show that we, that we care, that yes, we understand there were problems. We get it, right? Let's fix it. So they... They gather in the city of Trent a church council to look at Catholic doctrine and see what needs fixing, right? And to assert, this is what we stand for. This is what the Catholic Church is all about, right? You know, and prior to this, we can't really talk about the Catholic Church because it's the church, yeah? Protestantism gives us that difference. So they convene a council in the city of Trent, the Council of Trent, beginning in 1543. There are going to be three massive conventions over the course of 20 years to figure this all out. Because you might imagine this is not an easy process. They're going to go through everything with a fine-tooth comb, right? And they're going to address church doctrine and say, this is where we stand and this is why we stand there, right? And this begins in 1543, um, the Counter-Reformation the Catholic Church's response 
to the Protestant Reformation, the Counter Reformation. Right. Um, interestingly, this is one year before Michelangelo's Last Judgment. Remember that from the worksheet, where Christ is turning his full wrath to the damned. That's a Catholic work, right? And one can see that as being like, yo, Protestants, you know, you're going to hell. Right? That is the Catholic response to that, okay? The last of the three sessions, the last of the three conventions of the Council of Trent was held in 1563. At the last one, in 1563, the Council of Trent got around to the issue of religious art. Because for the Protestants, religious art was problematic. In Protestant lands, there became less and less demand for religious pictures. Two reasons. They don't worship saints. They don't use saints in their prayers. So images that are images of the lives of the saints don't have as much Right? Uh, attraction. Right? The other issue is that they're trying to say that they're not Catholic. Catholics love images, so we're, gonna, we're, we're not going to use them. And the third, image, third issue is there's that pesky second commandment. Right? The Ten Commandments, Moses, right? Ten, the second one says, you shall make no carved images of anything above the earth, on the earth, or under the water. No carved images. Graven images. Carved. Right? And Christians took it like, that means painted. That means drawn. That means anything. Because the point of the second commandment is that man should not try to do what God did. God created. Man should... Right? That's how it was interpreted. And so what happened in Protestant countries between around 1525 was, I think, the first outbreak and through the course of the 16th century, there were numerous outbreaks of people going into churches and destroying images. Statues, r- ripping the body of Christ off the crucifix, whitewashing over frescoes, right? Tearing down altarpieces. You wonder why we only have part of some things? That's why. Right? They got destroyed by people we call iconoclasts. Right? People who destroy images. Okay? So because this was a problem throughout all of Europe, the iconoclastic controversy, the Catholic Church decided, let's address the issue. Because they think that images should still be used. Images should still be made. Images should still adorn churches. To this day, if you go to a Protestant church, you see far fewer images than you do in a Catholic one. Protestants don't use a crucifix. Protestants use a cross without the body of Jesus on it, most often. Right? To this day, this is held true. What the Catholics said was that images are really important because not everybody can read a book. Images communicate with visuals. Anybody can read an image. They are the Bible for the illiterate. So we think that images should still be used because they have a prominent role to play in reaching out to people with the gospel story. Right? Okay, so they're good. They're valid. That's that's their main justification. Right? Images communicate where words cannot. Right? That's what they say. Okay? Now, if that's the main case, then what the Counter-Reformation says is then we need some we need some guidelines here on how to make art legible. How to make it so that Faisal could read it without taking a class. Right? I can read it without taking a class. If you just know enough about Christianity, which they would have at the time. Right? So what they said is there are basically three guidelines that art should try to follow. One, it should be simple and clear. That makes sense, right? You, the whole point of the image is to communicate. This is religious images, by the way. Strictly religious images. The point of the religious image is to communicate. Then it shouldn't be confusing. Right? 
needlessly learned and academic. You can almost hear these things as like direct reactions to what's going on with mannerism. Like no weird symbolism that nobody gets, like Venus, Cupid, Folly, and Time. Right? Clear and simple. We should be able to get it right away. Immediately intelligible. So that's the first thing they say. Oh my God. The second thing they say, it should be realistic. It should be accurate. Right? It's supposed to teach. Right? So it should be accurate. Realistic details. Okay? The third thing they said is that if it's supposed to reach out to the viewer, engage them with what they're looking at, then the other thing that religious art should have, or should be, is very emotional. Because the point is, it's supposed to make the viewer think pious thoughts. Make the viewer be engaged. Right? So those are our three rules set down by the Council of Trent. Because art is supposed to teach, it should be simple and clear. It should be realistic and accurate. It should be emotional. Right? And all three of those things are, in many ways, a direct rebuke of what's going on in mannerism which is more intellectual than emotional, right? Is confusing, it includes things for no apparent reason other than maybe some strange esoteric symbolism, right? And so if we look at Caravaggio, man, he nails it, right? It's clear and simple, and he uses the light to do that. So all we see is Paul and his horse, and then kind of lurking in the background, the groom to hold the horse back because Paul can't do it anymore. Right? Clear and simple. Realistic details. He's dressed like a Roman soldier. He's got the helmet and the sword. He's got the short skirt, right? I don't know the proper words for these things. Uh, his, his cuirass uh, for the breastplate, right? Uh, the, uh, the accuracy, right? The, the shoe on the horse, um, I've got some nice details. The groom, look at the look at the uh, the skin on the horse handler compared to the skin on Saint Paul. The horse handler looks like right like a farmhand. His his skin is grizzled. It's 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 tanned, and I mean tanned not just in brown, but I mean it's like leathery, you know, and then. A, a great detail, but he, as he's holding the, the horse's mouth down, and again, he's pulling the horse's head down, right, to keep it from rearing up. But look at his feet as well. He's got, like, dirty soles on his bare feet as well, right? Great realistic details. They're a different kind of realism than Jan van Eyck, right? They're not just this realism of little particular details that add up to some sort of symbolic encyclopedia, right? They're realism to, to tell the story, in a more engaging manner, right? And then there's the emotion, right? When things are in close-up, viewers have a stronger emotional reaction. Watch movies, right? When they want you to distance from the characters, the camera pulls back. Intimate scenes are filmed close-up, right? Just pay attention sometimes to movies that are well-directed and think about how the camera is telling you how to react to things, right? Couples kissing, you get close-ups, right? Because a close-up is more emotionally engaging. Caravaggio understands this even though he doesn't do photography, right? We're a couple hundred years too early yet. But he puts the figure right down close, and he adds this dramatic, stagey lighting that adds to the emotional impact of the scene. Right? He is counter-reformation art to a T, right? He nails it. So when we talk about the Baroque style that we're seeing with Caravaggio in particular and others as well, the Counter-Reformation played a role in the shift away from mannerism, right? Towards something that's clearer, more realistic, and more emotionally engaging, right? Here's some nice, okay, trying for some nice details. Come on. One more time. There we go. There's a nice close-up of Paul. 
eyes closed, a little reflection on his helmet. You can even see the feather reflecting on the helmet, right? Um, there's our, our dirty feet of, look at the toenail of the groom uh, directly above Paul there, right? This chafed little toenail, and then all the dirt on his toes, as well as Paul now reaches up. I love how the light comes through his thumb, right? Caravaggio has been looking. Um, we don't see the light source, right? But the light is so strong that it actually shines through his thumb. You know, as a kid, you used to do that. You'd take the flashlight and put it on your hand, you know, so you could see the gl glow on the other side of, of your hand. And here, uh, right through his thumb and then kind of coming around the side of his... Uh, this is the light of God, right, that has knocked him blind. Um, there's a close-up of the, of the groom holding the horse where, again, we can see uh, that, that sort of sunburnt nose and the leathery quality of his skin and how that's so different than 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 Saul of Tarsus right the man who becomes Saint Paul who is uh, if anything much paler right lives a, a very different life uh, than this farm hand who's holding his horse for him and then Every year there are better high-resolution images out there, so there's a close-up of his toe, and even a little, little gleam of, 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 of shine on the end of his toenail. So you can tell the difference between skin and dirt and, and, and nail uh, in these things. It's just utterly sort of spot-on realistic, right? One of his most famous works is this image where we see Jesus showing up to call St. Matthew to be one of his followers, Right? Uh, Matthew was early on, but not the earliest, so Jesus is off to the right with probably St. Andrew, who was one of the original men that he called to be a follower, and he's gesturing to St. Matthew, right? You will be one of my followers. Um, does anybody know what Matthew did for a living before he was a follower of Christ? Do you know what his, his job was, Jason? Was he, the tax collector? he was the tax collector, that's exactly right. Now, we saw images of tax collectors, we saw that... Uh, the money changer and his wife, right? It's sort of an image of money, uh, perhaps even the corrupting influence of money, right? And here's the idea that Matthew's now being called away from that. So Jesus is pointing to him. And again, typical Caravaggio in almost every respect, right? There's our, our off, out-of-frame lighting coming from on high that is the light of God, right? Illuminating the principal characters, being used symbolically, right? This is the light of salvation following on Matthew, just as this is the light of salvation following on Saul of Tarsus. Notice the color scheme in each of these. Caravaggio loves this really limited, simple color scheme. Sort of browns with a few highlights, right? There are a few more of them in the conversion of Paul with the greens in the costume, but you'll notice that it's mostly browns, reds, yellows, and with the calling of St. Matthew, that same sort of color scheme, right? That very earthy, ochre color scheme. So we read the picture, right? There's Jesus coming in with Andrew, and he's gesturing to Matthew, who is with his assistants, and they're counting the tax collecting from the day. So if we look at the table, we can see them going over the coins, and there's a sort of a growing reaction to the intruders. So the two boys at the far right react the strongest, right? Surprise. Who are these guys? What are they doing here? Matthew, not quite as surprised because he's getting it. He understands. You mean me? And you can see he's even pointing at himself, right? The other two at the far end of the table, they're out of the, they're out of the loop, right? They haven't yet even understood. They're still so wrapped up in the money, right, that they don't even realize that the Lord has come into the room, right, and that this amazing light has sort of uh, swept in behind them. Again, Caravaggio's uh, use of realistic details. Look at the difference between Andrew the fisherman, right, on the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus, right? Now, Jesus is the son of a carpenter. You would expect him to be sort of more ruddy in complexion and more sort of outdoorsy, farmhand looking, but he's Jesus, so he's not, right? Same with St. Paul, right? He's St. Paul, so he's not. The outward figure sort of shows that holiness, 
right? But look at Andrew. Look at his hair. When was the last time he got it? He washed his hair. You know, does he know the meaning of the word shampoo? Right? Uh, but he's a fisherman, so it's matted down, right? Sea of Galilee is not a saltwater sea, right? It's a freshwater lake, really. But still, there's that sense of him being, you know, for Caravaggio, he lives in Italy. He, he sees him as a sort of a, you know, Italian fisherman, right? And you'll notice that as Jesus points to Matthew, Andrew's pointing as well. And there's that idea of the gesture being the followers, right? He's got the same pose as Jesus does with his hand as he's pointing to Matthew. And Matthew's kind of getting it. Not quite there yet, right? So Andrew is a full follower of Christ. He's got the exact, almost the exact same pose in his hand that Jesus does. Right? Now, Caravaggio said, Caravaggio is this interesting character in that he's, He's a little, um, what do I want to say, uh, extraordinary insofar as uh, being atypical for what artists were like in the early 17th century. One, he didn't have any pupils. He didn't have any people that studied under him. Right? Going hand in hand with that, he said that he didn't study anybody else either that he was not influenced by anybody. Some people always like to say that. Nobody's influenced my work, right? But Caravaggio's obviously been looking at some people. Right? There's obviously some people he's picking up on. The style is kind of his own, right? This high-lit style that enhances the drama, that simplifies the composition, focuses us emotionally on the figures in the foreground. But look at that hand of Jesus. Who has he been looking at? Does that look familiar? It's not Dracula. We were just watching some old 60s British horror films this weekend, right? But that finger coming out like that with the thumb coming down. Is that like, a, it's on the Sistine Chapel? On the Sistine Chapel. It's Michelangelo, right? Um, I, isn't that nice? I put their fingers right together for you, right? Yeah, it's totally looking back at Michelangelo. Um, Caravaggio's first name is Michelangelo. Michelangelo Marisi de Caravaggio. So, duh, right, looking back at his namesake. But also, I think this is interesting, because, of course, Adam, right, Jesus is the new Adam. We've heard that before when we've talked about other works of art. And Caravaggio, I think, understands that as well, that that gives it a little bit of symbolism, too. Right? Again, our realistic details, uh, Matthew looking toward the light, looking toward Jesus, recognizing that his life is about to change. Right? It's accurate in a certain way, in that they do look like tax collectors, but they look like 17th century tax collectors. <clears throat> These people are dressed as contemporary to Caravaggio, not contemporary to Jesus. It's not historically accurate, but it's accurate in that it helps to communicate the meaning. Now, who knows exactly what tax collectors dressed like at the time of Jesus? And if we did know, it might actually complicate the communication. What Caravaggio, if we, you know, if we did that today, right? If we were to do a picture of Jesus wearing, you know, Adidas, or something, we'd, it'd be, there'd be hell to pay, right? But for Caravaggio, it helps to communicate, and it was it was accepted as part of as sort of meeting that requirement that it that it be accurate in its details, right? Uh, and so they're all dressed like dandy fellows from the 17th century. Now, I was mentioning that Caravaggio is sort of atypical. He's sort of out there. He's different than most artists. He didn't. He claimed he didn't study. Um, didn't have any pupils. He often didn't do preparatory studies on the painting uh, before he started to paint. He almost painted like an impressionist. He used to get in there and do it. Whereas from the Renaissance, you do drawings, you do compositional studies, you then draw the entire thing on the canvas and then start painting. But Caravaggio went right in. So if you look at the body of St. Matthew, it doesn't quite work. Like his upper body doesn't really sit on his hips. Right? See the yellow leg down below? Because, again, very atypical for artists at the time, he would just sort of go in and start to work on it, right? And you don't really notice it at first, 
Yeah. Right Victoria points out that you go, oh yeah, you're right. That that spine is kind of takes its mm-hmm. jump off to the right there. But he would just sort of go in and work on things, right? And and, and bring these things made him somewhat extraordinary as an artist at the time. The other way in which Michele, uh, Caravaggio was extraordinary is, is, is his actual life story. Um, his art is sort of the perfect example of counter-reformation art. Right? It's just, it's just it's the perfect kind of art for what the, what the counter-reformation wanted, what the Council of Trent said holy art ought to look like. Right? Religious art ought to look like this. His life was a mess. He was, a, he was, a, he was a, apparently a, a bare-knuckle fighter hanging out in bars, um, homosexual, uh, eventually got into a knife fight and killed somebody, and ended up dying quite young, still in his 30s, from malaria while trying to get away from the cops. He had fled Rome for Naples, and he was running away toward the seashore and goes through a, a marsh, right, a reedy marsh, and ends up getting bit by mosquitoes. Malaria, right? So he's got this lifestyle that's very different from the works of art that we see from him. The works of art have an uh, incredible sense of, of sort of piety and realism, right? And fit exactly what the church wanted, even if his life not so much, right? Look at uh, Andrew's feet down there too, right? That same dirty-footed apostle. Now, what's interesting about Caravaggio is that while he had no direct pupils, nobody studied in Caravaggio's studio, right? At the same time, he's easily one of the most influential artists of the entire century. People from every country saw Caravaggio pictures and painted pictures that looked like them, that borrowed his solution to the counter-reformation idea of making clear, simple, and dramatic art. Right? Clear, realistic, dramatic. So uh, we'll look at some of these people. We often call them Caravaggisti, followers of Caravaggio. Um, Caravaggio did uh, uh, secular pictures as well as religious pictures. Baroque pictures tend to engage you, right? St. Paul coming out right into your space. They tend to try to get you to participate in some way. So Caravaggio's lute player, that is young Roman boy playing a lute, flowers there, and there's a violin waiting for you, right? And his handle is coming right out to you. So it's like, well, let's make some music, right? And uh, the songbook is open. He's looking directly at it. It's still Caravaggio light shooting in from the top simplifying the scenes. But you'll notice here, as it reaches out to you, that it, it's opulent in a certain way. It gives you something for more than just a sense of sight. In fact, we might argue that all of your senses are involved in Caravaggio's paintings, particularly this one. We see it, we hear it, we smell it, flowers, we touch it, right, with the fabric, the wood, the glass. We taste it with the pieces of fruit in the lower left corner. All five senses are engaged in this picture. And we're going to find with, seven, with the 17th century, this is nearly there, that a lot of pictures right, engage all of our senses try to get us to buy into being part of this by doing more than just look. Right? We live these pictures. We use all of our senses. So we go to Orazio Gentileschi, right? Uh, worked at the same time as Caravaggio, may well have met him, it's hard to say for sure, but uses all of Caravaggio's tricks. Okay? Uh, pulls it out, and you might can you might mistake it for a Caravaggio. And it seems to be based on a certain level on our lute player over here. But revised and innovated a bit. So we have a female lute player rather than a male lute player. That could be uh, gender preferences of the two. Right? Orazio was straight. Caravaggio was not. 
right? Uh, she's tuning up. She's listening to it as she's as she's playing the music to checking the notes. And again, just like Caravaggio, there's a violin there for you, right? In fact, there are other instruments there as well. There's a, some sort of clarinet, the pipe, as if this figure is getting ready for a quartet. But part of it is that we're almost asked to participate. Part of this. And like Caravaggio, it's simplified. The background is just this mostly darkened field behind her that highlights her. The light seems to shine in from the upper right corner. Again, we do not see the source of light. Right? All of these are Caravaggio tricks that Orazio Gentileschi is picking up. Right? So Caravaggio had this massive impact, whether he's doing genre scenes, like the lute player, or religious scenes, like uh, the calling of St. Matthew or the conversion of Paul. Okay. Just quickly, and we won't really get into it yet, Caravaggio does this incredibly gory um, and again incredibly dramatic image of Judith slaying Holofernes from the Old Testament. Uh, we'll talk about the story on, on Thursday. But, and there's Orazio's daughter, Artemisia, our first woman artist, Artemisia Genileschi, the daughter of Orazio. And her version of the same in a Caravaggio manner. Right? So that's why I gave you Orazio Genileschi's first name on the slide, because we got two Genileschi's at the end of it. Right? Orazio and Artemisia. So we'll talk about this. We'll start with this on um, Thursday. We'll wrap up Italian Baroque and move to Spain from there as we're moving our way ahead. Okay? Those of you who have lower exam scores, I really do want to talk to you primarily just to talk about strategies for success, um, and see sort of your notes and whatnot. So please, if I wrote that on your, uh, on your exam, make an appointment to come and see me.